Today, we'll be diving into the shocking case of Brian Darrell Davis from Ponca City, Oklahoma. Now, before we get into the details, let me just say that this is a bizarre one. Davis gave so many different versions of what happened, it's hard to keep track. It's like he was auditioning for the role of world's worst liar. But don't worry, I'll do my best to keep it all straight for you. Our story begins in the early morning hours of November 4th, 2001. Brian Davis, then 27 years old, returned home from a night out with the lads. But when he got there, he found his girlfriend, Stacy Sanford, and their three-year-old daughter were nowhere to be seen. Immediately, Davis was like, uh, oh, where's my family at? So he rang up Stacy's mother, 52-year-old Josephine Sanford, who everyone called Jody. Davis was like, hey, Jody, you haven't seen Stacy and the baby, have you? And Jody was like, no, Brian, I haven't. Is everything all right? Davis replied, yeah, yeah, everything's grand. But could you do me a solid and go look for them? Jody, being the concerned mother and grandmother that she was, agreed. Fast forward a bit, and Jody still hasn't located Stacy and the child, so she decides to pop on over to Davis and Stacy's apartment to see what's what. Little did Jody know, she was walking into a nightmare. Now, what transpired between Davis and Jody inside that apartment is still hotly contested. Davis has changed his story more times than a chameleon changes colors, but one thing we do know for certain is that Jody Sanford entered that apartment and she would never come out alive. At around 9 a.m., Stacy Sanford returned home and stumbled upon a scene straight out of a horror movie. There on the floor was her mother Jody, beaten, stabbed six times, strangled, and sexually assaulted. Can you imagine finding your own mother like that? It's the stuff of nightmares. Shocked and devastated, Stacy immediately dialed 911. Meanwhile, about nine miles away, our guy, Brian Davis, was found seriously injured, having wrecked Jody's van in a single vehicle crash. He had been launched right through the windshield. Ouch! When the police arrived, they noticed Davis smelled like a brewery. Turns out his blood alcohol level was 0.09%. So not only was Davis suspected of murder, but he was also slapped with a DUI. Talk about a rough night. Davis was rushed to a local hospital and then later transferred to a hospital in Wichita, Kansas due to his extensive injuries. It was there that he would have his first chat with the authorities about what the heck happened to Jody Sanford. That same afternoon, Detective Donald Bohan paid Davis a visit at the hospital. And let me tell you, Davis's first tale was a doozy. He told the detective he remembered being at the club with his buddies but had no clue who drove him home or what happened once Jody arrived at his place. Davis was like, yeah, I remember Jody being in the living room, but after that, it's all a blur until I woke up in a field after crashing the van. Convenient memory lapse? I think so. Two days later, detectives Bohan and Steber decided to have another go at questioning Davis. Initially, Davis stuck to his I don't remember script, but as the detectives turned up the heat, Davis's story started to shift. Suddenly, he recalled arguing with Jody because she was giving him an earful about committing to her daughter Stacy. Davis claimed the argument turned physical with Jody cutting him with a knife. He said he punched her in the face, breaking her jaw, and then managed to wrestle the knife away, stabbing Jody multiple times in the process. Apparently, after this brutal altercation, Davis decided to take a little nap. When he woke up, he freaked out, hopped in Jody's van, and sped off, leading to the crash. But wait, there's more. The detectives confronted Davis with evidence suggesting Jody had been strangled. Davis was like, oh yeah, I might have choked her a bit while we were tussling, but I definitely didn't have sex with her. No way, no how. Spoiler alert. That last part turned out to be a big fat lie, big. Over the next few months, Davis served up three different versions of events to his girlfriend, Stacy. First, he tried to convince her that he thought Jody was an intruder and he was just protecting their home. Then 
He spun a yarn about arguing with Jody because he thought she was lying about Stacy's whereabouts, which led to a knife fight and a stabbing. But the real kicker came when Stacy confronted Davis with DNA evidence proving he had raped her mother. Backed into a corner, Davis concocted a new story. He claimed Jody came over distraught about her husband's infidelity. Davis, being the stand-up guy that he is, comforted her. One thing led to another, and they ended up having consensual sex. But then, according to Davis, Jody went full-on psycho, hitting him in the head with an object, and the stabbing occurred in the ensuing melee. Just when you thought Davis couldn't possibly come up with another version, he took the stand at his 2003 trial and spun a brand new tale. In this rendition, Jody came over searching for Stacy. They discussed Davis's need to commit to her daughter. Davis, showcasing his incredible sensitivity, made a tasteless remark about Jody's husband stepping out on her. Jody got upset, but Davis, ever the smooth operator, comforted her. They kissed and then supposedly had consensual sex for 15, 20 minutes right there on the bedroom floor. But the story doesn't end there, folks. No, Davis had to take it one step further. He testified that after their intimate encounter, he informed Jody that the sex wasn't worth his time and he could understand why her husband sought greener pastures. As you might imagine, Jody didn't take too kindly to this comment. Davis claimed she flew into a rage, whacking him in the head with a lotion bottle. What followed was allegedly a mad chase through the apartment, with Jody slashing at Davis with a knife. Finally, Davis managed to disarm her and proceeded to stab Jody multiple times as she reportedly continued her attack. Afterward, he said he wrapped Jody's lifeless body in a bedspread caught some Zs, and then made a run for it, leading to the car crash. Despite the brutal injuries he inflicted, Davis maintained he never intended to kill Jody. The prosecutors were having none of Davis's tall tales. They called his constantly changing stories ridiculous and argued that the physical evidence completely contradicted his claims of self-defense and consensual sex. They brought in an expert witness who testified that the bloodstain patterns at the crime scene didn't match Davis's account of a mutual struggle. In the end, the jury saw through Davis's web of lies. They found him guilty of first-degree murder and rape, handing down a death sentence for the murder and a century behind bars for the rape charge. Over the next decade, Davis threw every legal Hail Mary he could think of, filing appeal after appeal, challenging his convictions and death sentence. His lawyers argued that his hospital bed statements to police should have been tossed out because he was doped up on pain meds. They also claimed that the trial court violated Davis's rights by excluding testimony about Jody's husband's supposed infidelity which the defense believed bolstered Davis's story. But the appeals courts were not buying what Davis was selling. They determined that his hospital statements were given voluntarily and were fair game. As for the affair testimony, the courts deemed it irrelevant. With the mountain of evidence stacked against Davis, his ever-evolving stories, the sheer brutality of the injuries he inflicted on Jody, and the DNA proof that he had raped her, the courts concluded that none of the claimed errors would have changed the outcome of his trial. Davis's convictions and death sentence stuck. Convictions and... Finally, on June 25th, 2013, after exhausting all his legal options, 39-year-old Brian Darrell Davis found himself strapped to a gurney in the execution chamber at the Oklahoma State Penitentiary. In his last words, Davis quoted the Bible saying he would live and not die. But it was too little too late for a man who had committed such heinous acts. Davis was put to death by lethal injection, taking his final breath at 6.25 p.m. It's hard to wrap your head around the sheer horror and heartbreak 
that Stacy Sanford endured. Can you imagine having your boyfriend, the father of your child, rape and murder your own mother? And then to be the one to stumble upon your mom's battered, lifeless body? That's the kind of trauma that never really goes away. But as if that wasn't enough, Stacy then had to listen to the man she once loved spin one outrageous story after another, desperately trying to explain away the inexplicable. Betrayal doesn't even begin to cover it. Stacy's world was shattered in the worst way imaginable, all at the hands of someone she trusted. You know, we often talk about justice and closure in these true crime cases, but the ugly reality is that no amount of justice can ever erase the pain and suffering caused by monsters like Brian Davis. Sure, he paid the ultimate price for his crimes, but that doesn't bring Jody Sanford back. It doesn't mend the gaping hole he left in the lives of Jody's loved ones. But at the very least, with Davis's execution, the Sanford family could rest assured that he would never hurt anyone else. They could finally close the book on this nightmarish chapter of their lives and begin the long, difficult journey of healing. As for Jody Sanford, a beloved mother and grandmother, she was robbed of her life in the most brutal, senseless way imaginable. But her memory lives on through the people who loved her most. May she rest in eternal peace, knowing that the man who took her life was held accountable and that her story will not be forgotten. Well, there you have it, F.